Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Ocean Geographic Live this morning or this evening, your time. And we have very happy this morning. We have a um, uh, legend of underwater photography with us, Stephen Frink. He's been around since forever. And we have Alex with us in <laughs> Chicago and uh, Stephen in Key Lago. So thank you for joining us. Alex, please take it away. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, Stephen. I'm going to tell everybody a little bit about you and then we will get on to your presentation. So, Stephen Frank is among the world's most frequently published underwater photographers with a career spanning four decades. He's worked as a photojournalist for Skin Diver magazine for 17 years, covering much of the Caribbean, Bahamas, and Florida Keys for that publication. Subsequently, he worked as a director of photography for Scuba Diving magazine. Most recently, and for the past decade, Stephen has been the publisher of Alert Diver Magazine, a beautiful coffee table collectible magazine for the members of Divers Alert Network. Stephen also teaches a master class in underwater photography each summer in his home waters of Key Largo, Florida, and offers a few personally escorted underwater photo tours each year. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I can't wait for you to tell us some really cool stories about your images. So thanks. Uh, thank you, Alex and Michael. Thanks so much for inviting me. Good thank to you see you. Thank you here. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> it's so nice to I, see you. I see you guys like once a year at DEMA or-, or That's about you know, it. Yeah. Maybe at, at ADEX or something like that, but- Yep. Anyway. So it's you saw you last, you last year at DEMA, didn't we deny? It was at DEMA last year, wasn't it? Last year at DEMA, yeah. I think that uh, was the last, last time. Year, last year at, the, at DEMA, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. It seems like, seems like an, uh, ages ago, you know, in, in a century ago. <laughs> yeah, I know. Sometimes it seems like forever ago, and then other days it seems like it was just last week. It's, yeah. This has messed with time very much. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like it anyway. All right, I'm going to pull up your PowerPoint, and we will get to it. Oh, right. Michael, you need to... Uh, fix that screen sharing thing. All right, go ahead. Okay. Cut. Thanks. There we go. So what are we doing? I'm, I'm looking at your, my pictures on your yes. screen and, and I'm gonna tell that you everything is... I ever knew about it. Exactly. <laughs> yep, that's the plan. You're gonna tell us all the things. <laughs> all right. All your picture quick, tells all the story, huh? secrets. Yep, all the all right. secrets. <laughs> All right, that's you in case you didn't know. So it's a good place to start. <laughs> All right. I know that guy. Well, let's start with this oh, one. Guy, how long ago was this? <laughs> you know, probably not that long after I came to Key Largo in 1978. Um, I, well, actually, maybe this is probably 1980. I was starting to do work for dive magazines by then. I was working for a, a little magazine that was published in. Miami it was called Sport Diver. It's different than the Sport Diver that, that you might know from these days, but uh, Richard Stewart was a publisher. And one time they got blown out on, a, on an assignment in Marathon, and I had this little studio. I rented some space to motion divers to rent, rent cameras and to process E6 film. That was like what I did for a living. But I yeah. had an ad in the yellow pages, and when they got skunked on weather in Marathon, they said, can you go take pictures for us? I said, yeah, of course I can. Of course, I'd, I'd, I'd never shot wide angle at the time, and I'd never shot a model. So I borrowed a lens and borrowed a model and went to Marathon and, and did this job, and it, it turned out fine. And so after that, they said, well, will you be this roving photojournalist for us? So I, I say that this must be around 1980 because I'm seeing, I'm shooting both 35 millimeter and medium format images the first house camera I ever had was a, a Bronica, uh, a two and a quarter by two and a quarter in a CNC housing. So I see by, but it wasn't a good wide angle. Uh, it was only for fish. So mm -hmm. by looking at the images on this light table, I see that I'm already into my 35 millimeter realm. So this is probably the early years of photojournalism. Um, I'd started to travel to uh, mostly the Bahamas uh, Cayman, you know, that was kind of Anthony's Key Resort, for example, in the Bay Islands. I, I kind of had a, oh, I don't know, a route that they would all send me on. So I would go everywhere. I would go to the same three places every year. <laughs> so I had a milk run. Um, <laughs> this is a question before you move on. Um, like you, we, we, we started shooting a lot of, you know, those in, in selects and in medium format. 
what do you do with all this collection of, of uh, resources now? What do you do with them? Are you, do you digitize them or you, you still keep them or what do you do? Michael, I have this, I have this massive room of slides with a, like those, bo those books, the three ring binders. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, now imagine that that room has grown exponentially and, and I have this like Herculean task. If all of my slides are the horse shit that Hercules had to scoop out of the, out of the stable, that's me and my slides. <laughs> no, I, oh, no. <laughs> I, I, I haven't. They're I treasures. Haven't <laughs> the important, the important ones I've scanned, and I really, I really need to to go through every single book. There are some that are important because they have like, you know, the corals we have today aren't the corals we had in the early '80s, for example, mm -hmm. in the Florida Keys. And I want, I want those archival pictures of those big schools, or big schools of fish, big yeah. fields of staghorn and elkhorn. So there are some things that are legacy images that I can't let go. But there's also you know, a lot that, that should go. I just need to, to take the time to do it. So it's, it's like this overriding weight that, that oppresses me. I have to go through all these books and, and get it down to a manageable, you know, of the, of the 49 shelves of, of slides and books and three ring binders, I think they really could be seven when I'm done. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. But I'm not there. I'm not there yet. That's a lot to call through. I think you're going to need a lot more months of quarantine for that to happen. <laughs> you know, that's the only thing that's going to make it happen is quarantine. So <laughs> Better I'm, believe I'm, it. Not, I'm not grateful for it, but I'm going to try to make the best of it. There you go. Right, right, that's right. the way to go. All right. Let's see what we've got next. Oh, oh wow. Look at that awesome. camera. <laughs> the newest Speaking. of the new, no doubt. <laughs> Speaking of medium, medium format. So that's my Rolly Marine. So the Bronica was, Bronica and the CNC was my first one. Actually, I shot a lot of medium format cameras. I shot a Pentax 6.7, uh, this Roly Marine. You see, I have a, a Sub C 225, which was the, the rechargeable version. It didn't have to have that, you know, expensive 510 volt battery. You only got, you only got 12 shots per roll, of course. So each of these cameras uh, would have an EO connector, an electro-oceanic connector. So usually if I would go out with a medium format camera, I would shoot my 12 and then I'd also have like clipped off to my PC would be a Nikonis. And I, so I'd have another 36 shots there. Maybe I'd have a 15 millimeter lens on the Nikonis so I could shoot the fish with the medium format. And then I would uh, shoot the wide angle with the Nikonis. And the, um, the cords allowed you to connect and disconnect underwater. So I might, I might take, you know, three or four or five cameras sometimes but only one or two strobes. Wow. Wow. It's a lot of gear to manage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot and, of times we would just leave it in the sand and, and, and hope <laughs> and hope, right. we, hope we remembered where it was. <laughs> Seems reasonable. All right, so now we're on to Alert Diver. Exciting. Well, we are on to Alert Diver. The, the, first, <laughs> the, the first issue of the newly designed Alert Diver that I was involved in was um, the fourth quarter of 2009. So, you know, you'll have to do the math, but I think we've probably done like 34, 35 of these yeah. quarterly magazines since then. Um, you know, Alert Diver wasn't always this particular magazine. It, it always had the, the really good um, information about diver safety and medicine and research because it was by the Divers Alert Network, right? Mm -hmm. But it was a fairly modest format. And there was a the time I, I actually sat on the board of directors of, of the Divers Alert Network and it was, I'd, I'd been bent so many times in the past that I, I felt like I wanted to give something back to them. So I sat on the board and, and we saw this product and I thought, well, what if, what if we create this new quarterly magazine? And, and the thing I had in mind was a book called Surfer's Journal, which was like a really nice collectible for the, for the surf culture. And I thought, what if we make something like that for diving and, and use really good paper and print it the best we possibly can? Maybe we'll get advertisers and, and maybe if we do it as a quarterly instead of a bi-monthly like they were doing, maybe we can make it like, like, a, you know, like a, a, a very 
highly uh, collectible coffee table um, publication, which, which was our, our hope and dreams for this magazine. Wow. Well, we've always loved it. <laughs> I love this magazine. It's, Thank I think you. it's the best in, in the USA. Right? Well, it's not, uh, yeah, it's amazing. Very nice deal. I, 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 know, I know how important it is to you to, to print to the highest possible quality. So I, I know you can relate to what we're going through in terms of the paper we choose and the inks we choose and the, and the layout and the design. So uh, kudos to you. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that there are people in the world that, that care enough about the, the, our audience, our scuba divers, to provide the very best. Yeah. Mainly the photographer who spent so much money and time creating the pictures. And we want them to show them in the best possible way. I think that, that is, that is our, our thoughts behind that. Yeah. I agree. I, I think they deserve our respect. And um, yeah, I mean, we, I, I think we honed down to the, the best images possible and we, we have to print them. We have to print them exactly. to the highest possible print quality, you know, good paper, yeah. good opacity, uh, properly registered and good to go. Definitely. We try. <laughs> All right. Wow. Story time. Yay. Yes. Story time. <laughs> All right. So this one, actually, this is kind of a, a somber story in a way. Um, it, it wouldn't be just looking at it. it, it it's just, it's an image that has been widely circulated. Um, it was the cover. I shot it actually for Henderson. Uh, I've been very close friends with the folks at Henderson Aquatics for many years. And they sent me on a, they came to Key Largo and asked me to do a catalog shoot for them. And so this was one of the images they used on the cover of their catalog. And, you know, it's because of all the negative space, you know, it was like on the cover of scuba diving. And, but the, I guess, more than bittersweet part of it is the, the model on the left. Um, was a very close friend and we used to we used to swim together every morning and uh, he was a very skilled free diver and uh, one one day he you know he was having a hard time in the pool he was congested and you know he just really wasn't up to snuff swimming in his laps and, and and I didn't think any more about it until the next day when he was dead and um, he he went diving um, a deep dive to the wreck, deck of the wreck of the Duane and, and he was by himself and he came up and he, oh. and he had a shallow water blackout and um, oh. and, and oh. yeah I mean it, we've learned a lot about free diving I think in in, in years past I, I don't mean this to, to tell the story as, as like a bummer um, but he was he was a beautiful man um, a, a very dear friend a very skilled free diver um, but he was diving by him, free diving by himself. And, you know, I've, I've since talked to enough free divers, really top of the heap people, and they don't do that. They, you know, somebody looks out for them because that shallow water blackout is one of those insidious things that, you know, you just, you can't claw back from it. You just die. Nope. Yeah, exactly. Cautionary so, tale for sure. So, sorry. Yeah. Didn't mean just, That's okay. It's down. probably, it's best to start there. We'll go up from there. <laughs> yes. We'll go up from there. But I mean, every, every image does have a story. It, it, it has to do with the fish we photograph, the people that are in it, the circumstance, why I happened to be in the water that day. So Henderson took me in the water and, uh, and for many years, Mike was my go-to guy for male modeling. He was really good. Wow. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. This has to be so, Tahiti, right? Well, more Ma Morea. Uh, Morea. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So the black tip reef sharks at Morea. And I, I haven't been l lately. Um, I, I presume it's still plenty sharky. Um, this was probably from, oh, I don't know, probably the mid 2000s, maybe 2005 or six. Anyway, it's uh, just the sheer quantity of, of the sharks is what's appealing to me. And also the, you know, the corals are very nice. I think that's what's transformational. I, 
I've been to, to that particular reef a time or two since, and we've had coral bleaching, and, and so it wouldn't have been as good some years, but it's come back nicely too. You know, I think that's one of the things that, um, you know, we who travel see the, see the seasons of the sea. And sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. Sometimes there's crown of thorns infestations. Sometimes there's coral bleaching. Sometimes there's algae. Um, sometimes it gets bad and sometimes it gets better. Uh, for example, I just came back from, from Bonaire and, um, you know, it was, it was like a really happy ecological story because um, when, I, when I was there like in the, oh, I don't know, maybe the late 2000s, we were seeing a lot of algae on, on the reef and it was looking kind of rough. And then I went back in, I think 2017 was when it was transformational for me. And it was, the reefs were much better and there were more fish and water had better visibility. And I asked the dive master, I said, why is it so good now? I mean, what happened? What have you done? And uh, he said, you didn't know? We, we, um, there's a sewage treatment plant now in Carlendike. So instead of the whole uh, metropolitan area, which you can call any place in Bayern metropolitan, <laughs> but, the, but the main city, um, instead of being septic tanks, and, and now it, it, it was sewer with a sewage, sewage treatment plant. And in, in such a short time, it made a difference. We did the same thing in the Florida Keys, by the way. Um, we had, when I came to town, we had septic tanks mostly, sometimes just cesspools. It was really kind of awful. And, and they could demonstrate, like you could flush a toilet, like in the canal where I live, you could flush a toilet if you put dye in it. And then like in 30 minutes later, you would see that dye permeate through the bedrock into the canal. Wow. So, Thanks. I mean, it was, it was very clearly demonstrable that everything we put in the septic tanks was going into the canals and, and onto the coral reef, and we had a lot of nutrification as a result. But um, gratefully, to, you know, extraordinary expense, but now we have um, sewers throughout the Florida Keys. We have sewers and sewage treatment in, um, in Bonaire. And I don't know. I mean, it's not everywhere, but it ought to be. Absolutely. Yeah, it's so nice when you have good stories like that where you've seen reefs improve and with such a, such a simple change, you know, and um, it's nice. It's nice to have. Even, man like even mangroves, you know, they're, they're islands. Oh, that, yeah. You know, they, they considered mangroves an, an eyesore because they can't, they, it affects the ocean view. And they don't realize that the mangroves are a nursery. They're a, a buffer for the for the storm surge and I mean there's just so much that a that a mangrove does and you know gratefully in the Florida Keys it's it's illegal to remove mangroves and uh, I mean it should be everywhere if it's not. Absolutely yeah all right let's see what I've got for you next. Aha the turtle. <laughs> uh, the turtle so I was swimming around I, I had Michael I know you know this port very well I had my my sea cam with, with a mini fish eye port. And so everything was just normal on, on this reef. And this, this uh, turtle kept like coming to me and, and quasi attacking me and my camera. And I didn't really figure it out until later when, when I saw how much that port looks like a jellyfish. So, <laughs> oh. yes, yes. I, I know precisely why, why this behavior happened, but also with a conventional port, let, let's talk a little bit about technique. I guess what the, what the mini fisheye ports in the world do for a living, like a big, you could have done this with a big, like Superdome, the Superdomes we use, but they have like a big um, metal back, right? So you have a big eight inch dome with a metal back. And when, when your subject is that close to the dome, like that, that turtle was, you know, it couldn't, have been, it couldn't have been one inch away from the glass. And with a conventional port, you couldn't really do that because you couldn't get the light to it. So, but that's what the, the mini fish I allowed me to do is to, hand, I was hand holding the strobe so I could bring it in very close to where the oh. dome is. And then I was able to light the mouth, I, I think with a, with any conventional port, you, you probably would have had a very difficult time with that lighting. Do you agree, Definitely. Michael? Yeah, exactly right. You can, you can push it right in and yeah, exactly. 
That's the beauty so of that. Yeah. I, I just got introduced to my four inch mini dome about a year, no, two years ago. I don't think I've shot with anything else since. I've become completely obsessed with the mini dome. It's like the best thing anyone's ever made that I didn't know about. <laughs> yeah. yeah, until you want to shoot an over under, Alex. Fair enough. <laughs> Doesn't work for that. That is a no <laughs> over under thing. No. <laughs> Either over or under, not both. <laughs> And if you, look great, at, if you look at it ultra critically, you'll find that your corners are better with your with your eight, eight inch dome than they are of with course. your fish eye. Yeah, of but, course. But it is But you it is can't convenient. do this. Yeah, it's so fun. Great for you traveling can't, you too. You can't do that. Yeah. No, I so mean, it's, it's different tools for different, different yeah. objectives. And yeah. that just happened to be the right tool for that day. For sure. That's so fun. All right, let's see what we've got. Oh, this lovely angel. All right. You know, I, I don't know how many queen angel fish I've, I've photographed in my life. Um, many, 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 many. This but this one, fish. for some reason, resonates with me more than any of the others. And I guess it's just the, well, it's all about the eyes, right? So yep. we get the eye contact and the little bit of the S curve, you know, which is a classic compositional. Um, Gimmick is maybe too strong, but our, it, our eyes accept that kind of curvature. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also the depth of field. Um, I shot that with a 100 millimeter, a Canon 100 millimeter macro lens. And so it was able to, on the plane of focus, I was able to get the nose and the pectoral fins and the eyes, yet put all the other in, in reasonably soft focus. You can see even the sponge in the in the lower right is sharp mm -hmm. because it's on that same plane of focus but everything else in the background goes soft which which you know gives it a bit of more uh, three-dimensional yeah. perspective on the fish so yeah I, I think of all of my the queen angels of my life this, <laughs> this, this is the one I'll stop with wow sounds fair Better. beautiful fish amazing colors too wow Oh, nice. oh, very fishy. The best fish soup uh, out there. <laughs> all right. So this one um, was my wife, Barbara, and we're, this was many years ago on the wreck of the Numidia in, in the Red Sea. And there, there is significance uh, to this photograph um, in that it's, it's one I can never replicate for a number of reasons, but among them, all these soft corals are gone now. If oh. Michael, have you been on the shipwreck lately yes, in the Red Sea? Definitely. Uh, not not recently. No, no. Yeah. So I, this this is pro this is still a film image. So I'm thinking maybe this is from back in like 1987 or something like that. Oh, but wow. that the wreck was so astonishing, mm -hmm. and but it, it's also swept by a lot of current. Mm. And I think and I think what happens well current is where the soft corals come from mm -hmm. but I think current is also where the divers tend to hold on to these rails and I mean I don't know what happened I don't I don't know if it's divers that did it or if um, you know ocean acidification affected the soft corals but it, it's not the same wreck anymore and once the corals were gone mm -hmm. then you know then there's no reason for the, the anthias to hang out like this so yeah there, there was a whole ecosystem in this image in 1987 uh, that we'll, we'll never see again in our life, which is not to say there aren't like really wonderful places in the world. Um, sometimes I, you know, I, I get into this whole shifting baseline thing, like, like I saw it when it was really good and nobody else will. That's really not true because like, for example, I, I, I think the last big trip I did uh, before the pandemic was, was to Rajan Pat. Actually, it wasn't. It was to the Forgotten Islands, Ambon and the Forgotten Islands, but Indonesia at any rate. And, you know, there were these, like, massive, like, football field things of, of staghorn coral and, you know, the, the sea snakes and the soft corals. And it was really pretty spectacular. So, gratefully, there are, there are wonder, wondrous things that people are going to see in the world when they go diving. Uh, they won't necessarily see what we saw in in the mid eighties, Michael. Yeah. That's um, but you know, what does it matter? So long as it's beautiful to them and that's their new normal. And, um, if it inspires them and, and makes them believe 
in the sanctity of the ocean and the necessity to preserve what's there, but that's fine. I, I, I don't obsess about the things we've lost so much, except to gain greater appreciation for, for the ones, for when I see it and it's really good still. Yeah. I think that's why Michael and I are so obsessed with Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> It's one of those places that's I think still it's important to, so amazing. To send my message across to preserve what we have now. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, we do have this, uh, this existing baseline of, of really wonderful diving. Mm. Oh, yeah. competitive swimming. I, yeah, I a, a bit of a diversion. I, <laughs> I can't, it is a diversion. That's Missy Franklin, the, the Olympic swimmer, by the way. Oh. Very cool. So, you know, very, very famous, very skilled, uh, very charismatic swimmer. And I think she was probably the, such a, a big performer in the 2012 Olympics. We, we're fortunate. We get uh, really good swimmers coming to the Florida Keys to, to train. Mm -hmm. um, in the run-up to the 2008 Olympics, we had um, really amazing swimmers. Nathan Adrian worked out here. Miller at Tabak, who was the guy who... Uh, just was barely touched out by uh, Michael Phelps in the 100 meter butterfly. You know, the one that probably one of the most famous races ever in competitive swimming. But anyway, I, I came to, to scuba, I guess, through competitive swimming. I mean, that's yeah. what put me in the water. That's, that's why I cared about scuba diving. And uh, anyway, it, and I still swim for fitness, but uh, not competitively, but I have great admiration for, for people who, who, who get to this level. I mean, their whole life is, is based on tenths of a second. And, you know, for her to, to get to the place where she did, it, I mean, it, it's utmost respect to me. So when I have an opportunity to, to photograph these people, it, it's very moving to me. I mean, it's tremendous motivation to try to try to capture them and to, you know, and, and actually I, I learn a little bit when I, <laughs> When I, when I look at these photographs and I see the position of their arms and, you know, you can see it in her, her left arm, you can see her coming out of that backstroke pull and her hand position and stuff. It's, it's really very educational to me to watch a really good swimmer, you know, not so much when I'm taking the picture because that's all I think about is taking the picture. But when I look at it afterwards and I think, ah, oh, man, that's why they're so much faster than me. Well, now they're in better shape and 40 years younger, but... Anyway, that's another story. Inconsequential. <laughs> Inconsequential. But yes, it, it's a lot of fun for me. With, every year, um, the, the, the pool that I work out with in Key Largo is called Jacob's Aquatic. And they host uh, an, an Orange Bowl swim classic as part of the Orange Bowl festivities in Miami. So we do get, yeah, we, we do get really like the University of Michigan comes down and we get some really talented swimmers, which, which is fun for me. I got a yeah, question uh, for, this, for this picture. What lens do you use for this picture? This was a 16 to 35. Right, okay. So usually it'll either be the 16 to 35 or, um, or the 8 to 15. I used to use, in, in the old days, the, you remember the Mark IV that had a 1.3 crop? Yep, sure. Yeah, that, that was an amazing camera. I mean, it's you have technology that range, no good anymore. Exactly. But it was an amazing camera for, for this kind of stuff because you could put a, a 15 millimeter lens on it and you wouldn't necessarily get all that barrel dis distortion that you would with another, you know, with a full frame camera. But, and and I, I don't know what else to tell you. It's, it's, I, don't, I don't get paid for this. It's, I don't do it for any, anything other than the, the terrific ad admiration I have for these world-class swimmers. Fantastic, yeah. Sounds like a good reason. <laughs> oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> you know, we, we had, there was one season we had uh, this big infestation of Portuguese man of war and, and moon jellies. It was, mm. it was, it got so that people wouldn't even go diving. I mean, some, some days the dive boats would go six miles offshore. So it's, it's not inconsequential for them to load up 34 divers on the boat and go out there and wow. then to turn around and give them all their money back because you, you can't jump in the water because there's too many oh. Portuguese man of war. So, but there was one particular year, and I don't know why it happened, but we had like these man of war all over. So I said, okay, this is the opportunity for me to do over-unders. 
And I, I had a 14 millimeter lens with a super dome and um, just an available light shot. So, but I kept getting closer, closer, closer. And Alex, what do you think happened? <laughs> you came out completely unscathed, I'm sure of it. <laughs> <laughs> no. And Not you so can't much. Ima you can't oh. imagine how bad that hurts. I, I was, I mean, I knew sounds if, bad. if I got, if I got close and, and all of these like tentacles were hanging down, um, there was a chance I'd get stung, but really how bad could it be? Oh. Man, it could, it, it could be pretty bad. I, oh. I, I don't know if you guys know Spencer Slate. Yeah, I mean, everybody, yeah. yes. I guess in the, in the dive industry kind of knows Slate. He's yep. a big, robust, you know, full of life guy. And I saw, I saw him once with, get hit by a man of war and it like crossed, crossed over his chest. Oh. It, laid him, it laid him down on the deck of the dive boat. They're, I they're really, it. Yeah, it, it's amazing. It is impressive. It's insane that something it, so innocuous looking could do that. It's nuts. But yeah, amazing. That's such a cool shot, though. Thank you. Um, and no more dangerous at all. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we all know this one. Um, that's my daughter in the background. I, I, I really had one really, I mean, I've had several great trips to Cuba, but um, the first time I ever went, my daughter went with me. She was, um, she just, just this year has, has graduated with her uh, veterinary degree. She's an equine vet now. And, Fantastic. Um, yeah, so. Alexa, right? Alexa, right? Alexa, yeah. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah, so this, That's I think great. she was maybe in her first year of vet school at, right. at that time. And she had spring break and, and we, we went to Cuba. We were on, uh, we chartered one of the aggressor boats and I had one of my groups and, and Lexi went along. And, and this, this particular image, I mean, anybody who's, who's been there and photographed Nino knows it's, it's really a pretty innocuous kind of thing. Yeah. And, the, and the challenge is to try to, to try to get it different than anybody else has ever got it. Alex, you did it really well and did very well in, in nice. photo contest this, this year with your uh, sunset and crocodile shot. And Michael, nice. I've, I've seen dozens and dozens of shots that you've taken of the same animal. <laughs> but there was something about this one, the fact that it was my daughter, it, somehow this got picked up in the, in the, in the British tabloid text. And, and the gist of it was that, and I, and I don't know where, where they, they first of all obsessed on the fact that I was 69 years old. They said, 69 year old man feeds his 23 year old daughter to a oh, for, no. for a photo. <laughs> You're like, yes, it was, it's exactly how it happened. And, and then, and then it, went, it went massively viral. So um, <laughs> that actually, in, in not a good way, but it's probably one of my uh, more widely published photographs just because, um, because of the supposition I was feeding my kid to the crocodile. <laughs> People will believe anything, right? <laughs> it's funny. No, this, this guy must be the most photographed crocodile in the world. I'm convinced of it. <laughs> he is that. And then, of course, you know, you get the forced perspective from uh, close focus, wide angle, yeah. and you make, you know, he's really not that big. But I did a shoot once, a commercial shoot. It was for um, Vantage Cigarettes. I don't know if you remember that. But they used to have a campaign called Vantage, the Taste of Success. And so <laughs> we shot in the, in the BVI on the Rec La Rome. And it was my job to photograph like this diver with, uh, with these gold chains draped around his hand. And of course, the art director never didn't know anything about scuba diving. And all he knew was that when I showed him the pictures, that, that you know, the hands were supernaturally large because they were closer to the wide angle lens. You know, uh -huh. that force, for the same force perspective that we see on the crocodile we had on the hand. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'll, I'll never forget, he said, my God, these are the hands that ate Chicago. <laughs> so, so I had to go back. I, I had to go back underwater. I had to shoot it a second time with, you know, with, with the hands on the same plane as the face. So uh -huh. his hands were no longer eating Chicago. And we, <laughs> we, we could make the ad. But sometimes it works for us and sometimes it works against us. Right. That's funny. <laughs> Good one. Oh, this is just lovely. 
you know, this is the, um, remember Ocean Realm magazine? I'm, I'm yeah. sure you do. Yes, of course. That's beautiful. So, so I have a bunch of copies. So the, the, two, the, two, the two women, the publishers of, of, at Ocean Realm, they're from Texas. And um, I saw them at the Dima show, and, and this image had just been published somewhere. And they said, all right, Steve, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but we know Photoshop when we see it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes, but you do not, actually. So huh. this, um, I shot this at Anthony's Key Resort. Yeah. And as you can imagine, and it was on film. So it oh, was wow. the, at that, at that time of day, I had, I had a Nikon F100 on motor drive. And at that time of day, you, you can't really see down in the water, right? You, I mean, you can, I had a sense of where there might be dolphins, but I, I didn't, I couldn't predict where they were going to come out or what they were going to do. So I pre-focused, I, I had a kind of a crappy 24 to 120 lens and I put it in manual and uh, my fastest shutter speed and I pre-focused on where I hope the dolphins might come out and I exposed for the, for the sunset and, and they came out like this and wow. bam, 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 you know, Fuji Velvia. And of course I didn't see it for a while. I, I put it in the bag with all the other film and then I took it back to Key Largo and I processed my own film then, you know, I always did. And so I, I remember taking it off the reel and hanging it up. It was kind of coming out of the, the, the wedding agent, the last step. And I saw it against the fluorescent light. And I said, oh man, that's, that, that's a shot that's going to be meaningful to me forever. Yep. And in fact, it, and in fact it was. And it's, it's, I've been back to Anthony's Key many times and uh, Samir Glindo is, the whole Glindo family have become very dear friends. And we laugh about this because I can't tell you the number of photographers that have come to Anthony's Key Resort and they say, well, we want that shot that Frank did. We want the, we want the <laughs> leaping dolphins against Bailey's Key. You can do that for us, right? Yeah, call and, them right in, call them the dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> well, number one, nobody, including me, has ever been able to get the dolphins leaping towards each other. That's not really oh. what they, that's not what they do in nature. I mean, think about all the leaping dolphin shots you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. They're they're kind of it's like this synergy, right? Yeah. Have you ever seen this? I, yes. I never have. Not, not, I yeah, no, not, not, not like that. They're usually both the same direction. Like yeah, yeah they're, they're usually both they're usually on their yeah. way somewhere. Yeah. It's the same direction, and you know there may be differential height yeah. or one thing or another, but anyway, nobody <laughs> else got it, and I never got it again either. <laughs> Probably won't either. That's a, a really unique one to capture. It's one of so those very fun. special moments. Yeah. Very, very. Yeah. The other thing is you have to do it in. You have to do it in the winter time. I'll give you a hint. Those, those, at, at nine o'clock at night, those dolphins aren't interested in doing that. <laughs> it need. It needs to be a pretty short day. It, you know, the sunset. Need, the sun needs to be setting around five thirty, six o'clock, or you're not going to get it. Right. Oh. All right. right. I, I, just, I just gave like every that's it. everyone to know. <laughs> all right. Those are all the tips we get for the day. <laughs> cool. Oh, pretty manatee. Okay. You know, the thing, I think the, the transformational part, I mean, I've shot, many, we've all shot many, many manatees over the years, but the, um, the combination of the environment, the tree in the background, and obviously the reflection is, is the meaningful part of this image to me. Um, there, there's, of all the manatees I've shot, I could probably drill down to six favorites. This being one of the six for, for, the, for that particular reason, just the, the reflection. It is beautiful. And it's so nice to have part of the environment going on in there. It's so nice to see the tree roots. It's really, oh, it's a pretty one. I love that. Uh, this is not a happy photograph, I, no, I guess you know. No. All right, so I got to tell you a little story about when I came to town. When I, so I came to town in, to Key Largo in 1978, and um, I, I dived with ocean divers, and, and they were at the south end of town, which, you know, so 
to get up to the elbow or to Key Largo Dry Rocks, where this one is, where the Christ statue is, or even more to get to Carysport, it was a long boat ride. So particularly up in, in Carysport, there was a place called South Carysport, and it had these uh, like fields of staghorn and elkhorn, kind of like we see in Indonesia today. And so this was like maybe 1979 when I had my first wide angle lenses. And so like the first time I went up there, uh, I, I had a macro lens, so I couldn't shoot all these beautiful coral seascapes. And then I didn't go, go for another six months and my, then my Nikonis flooded. So I, I didn't get the shot then. So anyway, this, this went on, like getting up to Carey's Ford once or twice a year over about four years. And I never really got the shot, embarrassingly, I never got the shot of these, these fields of staghorn that Jerry Greenberg, mm -hmm. for example, has in his portfolio. And then one time I went up there and, and they were gone, Alex, the, the, they were gone. Wow. And it wasn't a storm and it wasn't, it, it was just that they died. Yeah. And, yeah. And, it, and it happened that fast. It happened in, in six years of my life that it went from good to like really Gone. depressingly bad. Yeah. And, wow. and this is, is probably in about the same span of time, there's a giant brain coral uh, overlooking the Christ statue and it stayed good for, for many, 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 many years, which is astonishing because, you know, it, it's a snorkel kind of area and, you know, people would, you know, sometimes you'd see people standing on the coral yeah. or their fin yeah. tips would hit the coral. But for many years, it didn't matter because the water quality was that good and it, it would just come mm -hmm. back. And then like this uh, death of a thousand cuts, right? Um, yep. The water quality got bad. We had this big die, die off of the diadema. You know, there was oh, right. uh, yeah. all, the, all the talk of the Sahara dust this, this summer. You know, there were, they kind of think that there were pathogens that came over in Sahara dust and it was... Uh, it like cloaked the whole Caribbean and, and the South, South Atlantic. And yeah. so like one day we cussed the, the long spine and sea urchins because they're sticking us in our toes on a night dive. And then yeah. one, another day we went out and they were all dead on the bottom, like all their spines in little concentric oh. circles laying around the, laying around the sea urchins. So, wow. you know, when the urchins went, they ate the algae, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was, uh, that was a very profound uh, problem, which was manifest in the, the kinds of images that we see here. There's really only six years separating these two photographs. So Jeez. you would think of, you would think of coral reefs moving in like glacial paste, but really it's not. The, the changes to our coral reefs happen so very quickly and, and, and tragically that, that brain coral doesn't even exist now. It was, um, mm. it was wiped, it was wiped clean by uh, Hurricane Irma. So, but uh, uh, here, there's good. There's a good. There's a good part to this story. Okay. Anybody who goes there now, where the substrate was, is now a bunch of new coral plantings. The Coral Restoration Foundation. Oh, good. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm actually on the board of directors great. of the Coral Coral Restoration Foundation. And cool. if you, if you go dive the Christ statue now, you'll you really see a lot of new coral growth, um, both like on the. On the north side, where the brain coral is, you see a lot yeah. of a lot of pretty, very healthy elkhorn. And then over on the uh, south side, on the back side of the statue, you'll see some staghorn. So, uh, if you get up around, you know, Carey's Ford and Pickles, there, there's a lot of places where actually tens of thousands of corals have been planted. And uh, it, you know, and and the. Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary is, is very supportive of, of, of diadema restoration projects, coral yeah. restoration pro projects. So um, when you look at a photo like this, you, you could be depressed, but you yeah. should take heart that we're not just rolling over. We're, we're, we're trying to do better. We're trying to educate people about water quality. We're yeah. planting coral. I don't know. You know you, some people ask me sometimes, where, where, is the fa where was your favorite dive ever in life? And my stock answer is, do you mean from a dive boat or a time machine? So, uh, <laughs> yep. 
Well, oh. that's anytime everyone always asks uh, Sylvia Earle that same question. They're like, where is your favorite dive site? And she always says, anywhere 50 years ago. And it's like, oh, <laughs> dang. Well, that's not an option. <laughs> I guess we'll just power through. But yeah, things have changed so much in a relatively short frame of time. So, yeah. But all the restoration work that they do at, at Coral Restoration Foundation is so great. Such a good organization. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the work they're doing. Yeah. They never stop. No. Not too many better things than this, though. <laughs> well, yeah, the humpback whales from mm -hmm. Tonga. It's, it's, uh, and I, and I got to say, you know, we're, we, we just had a photo contest in, in our magazine. It'll be in the, in the next issue. And I see all the places in the world people are, are traveling for, for photographs and the, the quality of the images that are being produced. I mean, Tonga in particular. I mean, Michael, think, think about the humpback whale shots we were seeing 12 yeah. years ago compared, yes. compared to the ones we're seeing today. Yeah. You know, people are getting in heat runs and, you yeah. know, they're getting in clear water and they're, you know, there's just some really astonishing images being, being done. I mean, you, you see them, you know, gratefully we see them on social media. Um, you know, I don't think there's a huge market for stock photography like there, there used to be, but at least we get to share this culture, this culture of exploration and, um, and reinforcement by means of, I guess, social media. But, um, you know, there has to be some reason to get us out there to get us swimming alongside a whale. Yep. No, still need to get out there. Never been to Tonga. Still need to do that. Yeah, but it's very, very crowded now. I think you could That's get what I hear. numbers of boats now. So a lot of people are moving away, away from Tonga to the, to the region. Silver Banks, I think a lot of people yeah. are doing now too. Yeah. For well, the Silver Banks too. Yes, of course. Yeah. And the visibility is not as good as, as Tonga. But exactly. Yeah, it's not the same water. Remember, remember that yeah. shot when you're, you're looking at some of the legacy things? There was, the, there was a shot that you showed of uh, an alert diver cover with a hammerhead, a great yes. hammerhead. Yeah. yeah, the hammerhead, yeah. Yeah, that, that was like... That was the year, the, the first time that, a, I guess, an image of significance had gained wide circulation of, of the great hammerheads in Bimini. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh. And uh, like the next year, and Everyone. every year thereafter, it, <laughs> it, it, just, it just went off. Yep. <laughs> right, Michael? Yep. Oh, yeah. Everyone so, had to go see the uh, tigers and the hammerheads there. That's, that's so funny. The tigers and the hammerheads. But that's cool, yeah. you know, I mean. It's a great that's, that's what we do for uh, that's that's part of storytelling, right? I mean, yeah. If if uh, if we wanted to keep it a secret, we wouldn't put it on the cover of a magazine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's fine. And if I did, uh, if I did, Michael would have, so I might as well do it. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> that's funny. Okay, so this oh, is wow. a few cameras. <laughs> This is a few cameras, but they're not all. But they're not all mine. You don't <laughs> dive with all of these at once, no. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I don't. I, got, I, I will tell you a story though. Once about a small world. I was flying into Sarong, last leg on to Sarong, and I got on this little bitty airplane, and um, uh, David, David and Jen got on. David Dublay, and and I, I had just recently sold him a, a C cam for a D eight hundred. And I, he'll probably get mad at me for telling the story, but he'll get over it. <laughs> anyway, he said, um, he said, How that, how's that housing working out for you? He said, oh man, I, I, gotta, I gotta get another one from you. I said, why? He said, well, because I, I put it on the bottom and I went off to shoot some other stuff and the current picked up and um. the current swept it away and I never saw it again. Oh. Yep. <laughs> This. Jennifer wasn't on that dive, and she, she came back without a camera. Boy, did he get scream at. <laughs> oh, so you know the story too. I know right? the story. Oh, <laughs> man. In, in the reef after him, Dubilee Reef. <laughs> uh, that's great. Well, anyway, so the, these are not all mine, but it, it, it was on, I mean, clearly it was on one of my, my photo tours, and, you know, I, a lot of my guests are sea cam enthusiasts, just as mm -hmm. with you too, right, Michael? A lot of. A lot of the people yeah. to travel with a shoot sea camp, and um, so this was just a shout out. We we have a mutual friend in in Harold Hordash um, mm -hmm. yeah. from from sea camp, and so I, I took this one to to send to him and 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 make him feel good about himself. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's a lot of silver. So <laughs> that that's a it. lot. That's a lot of a lot of Seacam silver on the deck there. Yep. Yeah. That's fun. And you don't just shoot sea life. <laughs> no, you know, every every so often I I do have an opportunity to, to shoot fashion. Um, I've been called on to do a, a number of things for Rolex and Victoria's Secret. And, you know, I, I'm not I'm not the the mainstream shooter on a project like this, but they'll they'll call me in. Like for example, this was um, this was for the Victoria's Secret swim uh, television okay. show. It was I think it was uh, on CBS. It was filmed in Puerto Rico. Got it. And um, so my job was to shoot a little bit of video, but also like over unders, little little things that you know had to do with not. How can I say it? Not purely product stuff, mm -hmm. um, but but in this case, it was more of the environmental things that they might use for, like let's say you're going to do a in the catalog a double page spread and then have a bunch of insets of of the catalogs with the with the product numbers and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean that that's what I get called on for just those um, those environmental portraits of, of beautiful women and 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 bathing suits and and the tropical uh, nature of, of the catalog, you know, why, if you're going to have a bathing suit and look good in it, you ought to go somewhere that, where there's sun and sea, right? Definitely. So, <laughs> so it's, it, it's my job to bring those back. Not the worst job. <laughs> no, it's fun. I, I like those big shoots, you know, it's, um, yeah, it must be fun. You know, there's, there, you know, there's like hair and stylist and we had one that we did for, I, I worked with a, a very, very clever photographer, a guy named Russell James, uh, okay. brilliant photographer, does a lot of stuff for, for uh, Victoria's Secret. And he called me in once for one for Rolex. And so the, that particular job was he, had, he would have a different supermodel come in literally every day. Well, two of them <laughs> would fly in because we're, we're working in Nassau. He would shoot them in, in a studio. We had a, a ballroom in the Atlantis Hotel and he had it all set up with you know, with a green screen and a fan and gowns and things like that. So to try to simulate the, um, you know, the look of, of like waves and, and then it was my job to shoot the plates underwater. Um, uh. So, so then because of the way the time worked, he would take the images and he would send them to the, this was for Rolex Europe. It was for a big spread in French Vogue. So, all the art directors and the and the Photoshop talent were in Paris. So we would shoot during the day, all the digital files would get sent to Paris, and then when we got up in the morning, we would have breakfast and we would see all these composites of um, his beautiful women wearing Rolex watches uh -huh. against my C fans and, and uh, Elkhorn corals that we shot out on Southwest Reef with Stuart Cove. So yeah, it was, I think it ran as maybe 16 pages in, um, French folk. Wow. That's wow. neat. Very cool. All right, we're gonna finish with the crazy one. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So that was at, at Tiger Beach, obviously. Somebody yep. just asked me the other day, did have I has, have I ever lost any any dive gear to to like a shark attack? And well, I guess that day I did. <laughs> I, lost a, I lost a cord, but I didn't lose anything else. The 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 strobe actually got pretty well wedged in, into the mouth. And oh. so I had to swim, I had to swim quite a ways. I mean, if I would have let go, I probably would have lost it. Or, I mean, yeah. I don't know where it would have gone by the time you spit it out. But I, I swam a couple hundred yards along with it and um, he released it and I went back and took some more pictures. <laughs> so, <kind laughs> That's of, funny. Uneventful except for the levity of the image. Right, yeah. That's funny. Wow. That one goes on a wall. Yep, definitely. <laughs> okay, now it's just back to us. Cool. Um, <laughs> I'm a bit disappointed. I didn't see one of one of my favorite picture of yours. That's my favorite. One of the most memorable picture I've seen for you know I've remembered. Put it up. Picture. Which one? The one of Alexa and the dolphins. That is the best picture of all time of yours I remember. Alexa, Alexa and the dolphin. Yes. I, you know, I, I saw that. Oh, wait, no, you, you hear that? You hear that in the background? I said, Alexa, yeah. the stinking Amazon's talking to me. It's so annoying. 
<laughs> oh, I will have you know, I have a small lovebird that's, that's my little pet, and she's always hanging out, and she shreds everything. And your magazines are one of the only things in the house she is not allowed to shred. So <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Wait a second. I, 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 can pull it, I can probably find it on my computer and show yeah. it to you. Yeah. Okay, let's see it. Let's see it. Uh, it, it'll take too long. I think it'll take oh, too okay, long. Okay. All right. All right. But all right. Tell us a story send, about that picture. I'll I, remember, remember the story. If I send it to you, can you put it in at the end yeah. of the Facebook feed? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Absolutely. Sure. Yes. It's, it's all right. I'm going to tell you the story. I'm going to give you the setup, and then you're going to. We'll close out with this story with this picture. Okay, Alex. Okay. Okay. Sounds all perfect. Right. All right. So this is the last thing I'm going to tell you. So Lexi. My daughter was three and a half years old, and we were, we were uh, diving with the dolphin experience in, at UNEXO, and we had been out doing a, an open ocean kind of thing, and we were coming back, and, and I, I said to the dolphin trainer, I said, How, can, can anybody snorkel with these dolphins? Have you ever done that? And they said, well, geez, no, we've never done that. We've never taken the time to do that. I said, well, look, my, my daughter's here. And it would be wonderful if, if she could swim with the dolphin. And, um, and so we got in the water, and God, it was this magical thing, which you'll understand when you see the photograph, because she was only three and a half years old. Oh. And she's swimming alongside, and I mean, they're big dolphins, right? But mm -hmm. compared to a three and a half year old kid, it's, <laughs> it's really massive. And, and like she had her, her hand on the side of the dolphin, and she told me later oh. she could she could she could feel the dolphin's heart, oh. and she the tactile sensation of, of the skin, and oh. I mean it was just this I don't know I mean maybe I'm projecting being the dad and all, but I think it was like really a, a very profound moment of significance. But then when all of this was happening and we were having this this true moment, there we heard from the boat, shark, shark, shark. There's a shark. Oh. And so, so I looked up, and she looked up, and she then she turned to me and she said, "Daddy, it's just a nurse shark. Don't worry about it." <laughs> <laughs> You're like, "That's that, my kid." <laughs> that's my kid. I thought that was that was pretty aware for a kid three and a half years old, right? That's great. Yeah, I love cool. that. <laughs> How cool! Oh, all so right, well, that's all I got. Man, Thank you so got. much for being with us today. Thank you so much for for the story, and it's it's good seeing you again. What what's it what's was. what's up from for, from now from now now that you're shut down? What's 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 next? Well, I did cancel all my travel for 2020. I, I killed the Galapagos trip, my June yeah. uh, digital masterclass, and and PNG. My first my first scheduled trip now is uh, back to the Galapagos again for May of 2021. I'll go do the uh, Great White Sharks in in Guadeloupe in 2021. I've got I've got maybe three or four like really good trips in 2021, and about the same for 2022. So, okay. if um if anybody in the world will let Americans into their country, I, I think we'll start diving again. <laughs> right. Uh, right. I'll nuts. be fine next year. I'll be fine. Yes. Well, I, Open I for 2021. So. I'm going to, Michael, I'm going to come and see if you can help me out with an Australian passport so I can travel. <laughs> you bet. Thank you so you much. You and me both again. get in line. No. <laughs> and everyone is joining us. Thank you so much for joining us with, with, with uh, today. And uh, we'll see you again tomorrow with uh, our forum call Trending, Trending Blue. Trending Blue. Yes, exactly. we've got Trending Blue tomorrow. Thank you, Stephen. Yes. All right. Thanks so All right, much. Thank, it's great to see you. you. I enjoyed it. Bye-bye. Have a good night.